Okay, um, good morning and welcome to uh, today's session. We continue with Book of Acts. So far, we have um, completed till Acts chapter 19. Uh, and we just saw the beginning of Paul's third missionary journey. So, you know, we're going to get into that today, uh, look at his third missionary journey, how it went on, and, you know, how it um, came to an end. So, I uh, just want to request one of us to pray. After that, you know, we can uh, begin to discuss. So, uh, any volunteers this morning to lead us in prayer? Yes, Asha, please go ahead. Dear God, thank you so much for everything, Lord, as we're learning the Book of Acts, God, that we may understand the details and the depths of it, God. Thank you so much, Lord, for this class. I pray that as Pastor Nancy is teaching, Lord, that you pour out your wisdom and knowledge. And also, I pray for each one of my classmates, God, that those who are having health issues or any kind of issues, God, I pray that in the name of Jesus, it is healed and restored. And thank you, Lord, for everything. Um, in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Asha, for that. Um, we were at Acts 19. We looked at the initial part there about how um, Paul goes and he asks the people about the Holy Spirit. And they had not even heard of such a thing as the Holy Spirit. So you know, he shares about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He updates them right, uh, regarding uh, the fact that after the baptism in water with John uh, John the Baptist taught, now there is something known as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He prays for the people, they are baptized in water. And then, you know, we uh, see what else happens uh, in Ephesus. Ephesus is, I shared with us that it is a place of worship to a goddess called as Diana. Uh, she is also known as uh, Artemis in their language and uh, in a famous city of worship you now Paul has to go and preach the gospel each city has its own challenges uh, we saw earlier in Athens that the people were of the intellectual kind okay so in Corinth uh, again they were uh, spiritual people they were uh, very, you know, their, their lifestyle was very immoral. So it was a different experience in Corinth when, you know, Paul went to minister there. And uh, uh, though he expected a good uh, response to the gospel, he found that the Jews were not responding and thereby, you know, he had to make a decision to actually go to the Gentiles. And uh, you know, there's an uproar against him. However, thank God, you know, in every place, uh, God had a way of bringing escape to the people who were walking according to his purposes. So uh, the uh, the magistrate or, or the person in charge there, uh, or maybe somebody equivalent to the mayor or something like that, uh, he, uh, Gallio, he says, why are you bringing to me uh, matters which are not legal and uh, Therefore, you know, you go ahead, you settle uh, your own issues. And that's the way in which, you know, uh, he was actually uh, released from the situation uh, in the city of Corinth. Uh, but uh, a couple of very interesting things happened in Corinth. We know that, uh, uh, you know, in this commercial metropolis uh, and even Sin City, um, he met co-workers like Aquila and Priscilla who were uh, most likely, you know, they came to know about Christ through Paul. They were equipped with the word and they became such wonderful teachers that uh, they were the ones who actually helped Apollos, you know, another eloquent and learned man for him to update himself in the things of the uh, word of God. So, Overall, you know, Paul's time in Corinth was about 18 months. Uh, and uh, after that, he he kind of did a little bit ministry around the area of Corinth in that region of Achaia. So, you know, we have a place like uh, uh, Sencria where he went and, you know, there he ministered. Later on in uh, Romans, the book of Romans, you read about the church of Sencria whose uh, uh, person in charge is a lady known as Phoebe. So 
in this manner uh, the ministry went on uh, paul obviously uh, wherever he's going right now he is not alone he has a team of people with him so you know, he has other co-workers um, you know apart from uh, aquila and priscilla so you know he works uh, along with all of them and then you know from there he moves out so they move out of corinth and they come to a place called uh, ephesus so that that's what we saw he just touched ephesus and then you know he uh, went past that place uh, and returned to jerusalem so that's how his uh, uh, second missionary journey ended now third missionary journey he he began this missionary journey and uh, he went through the regions you know which are uh, familiar for us the regions of uh, galatia and this time around you know he comes directly to this place known as ephesus so that's where we were at and uh, about the city of uh, uh, ephesus we are uh, talking about it being this uh, place of worship to goddess dina and uh, there the uh, paul ministers about the holy spirit and then we see a, a very powerful supernatural ministry being demonstrated through his life so uh, you know that again is a highlight of the ministry of uh, paul so you know that's what we were reading so we'll again kind of go back there and pick up so we said that uh, from verse 11 some unusual miracles okay they took place in uh, uh, paul's life so what exactly happened was there were handkerchiefs and aprons from his body which were brought to the uh, sick and uh, just those materials as they touched the sick you know, they were getting healed so in this manner uh, uh, you know, God's power was revealed in this city of Ephesus. Now, I already told us that it was a religious city. Okay, so it was a religious city, and not just a religious city. A little later, as we read uh, in Acts 19, we'll also recognize that they were into rituals and they were into witchcraft. So uh, they were familiar with practices like this. Okay, uh, you know, maybe taking uh, certain substances and uh, use those substances in the rituals or uh, practice principles you know, that they have uh, seen work in the spirit realm. So for the city of Ephesus, all these things were not very new. They were already dabbling in the occult. So they had a familiarity however paul is the one who comes and he demonstrates the right kind of uh, you know of uh, spiritual power now we know that there are two sources we have god uh, who is the source of the true spiritual power uh, but there is also you know on the other side the dark side where satan and his demonic kingdom uh, uh, show their power Okay, now we uh, already know that there is no comparison of God's power to the demonic uh, powers. However, the people there, they were used to the uh, demonstration of demonic powers. So what we'll do is, I think we will start from uh, reading from uh, verse 11, Acts 19. So uh, that way uh, it gives us a proper continuity. Would uh, somebody please read from verse 11 to verse 20? Acts uh, 19, 11 to 20. Pastor, can I read? Yes, yes, sir. Shri Kumar, please go ahead. Thank you. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs of apparents and the disease departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, ex exor exorcists, took upon, the, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preached. And there were seven sons of 
of one Skiva, a Jew and a, and a chief of the priest, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in the the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed uh, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and the Greeks also, dwelling at Ephesus. And the fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and shewed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found 50,000 pieces of silver. So, might, so mightly grew the word of God and prevailed. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you, uh, Shri Kumar. So, uh, as we can see here, the supernatural is uh, uh, being demonstrated. One, of course, is through the uh, unusual miracles that God did. And we've talked about these unusual miracles. We've tried to understand that. We try to, um, uh, you know, come to a conclusion as to how these things actually work. Uh, earlier, we saw that God's power could work through non-substances. So uh, in the life of Peter, it was his shadow which was healing people. So we can't put God in a box. So miracles took place through shadows. Uh, this time around, it's, uh, you know, some, some pieces of cloth uh, which were on Paul's body. So we know that Paul was a tent maker, right? So that's how uh, he uh, is described in uh, Corinth and Aquila, Priscilla, were other tent makers. So tent makers would have used some form of sweat bands okay, on their bodies, their wrist, or their head. So some kind of sweat bands um, while they work. Now, when we read about handkerchiefs or aprons, it's referring to that. So some uh, cloth which Paul generally used, even when people would take that and touch a possessed person, the demons would flee. So that's so incredible to know that uh, earlier the power of God was flowing through non-material uh, substances and this time around material substances. So something about the way the anointing is being carried. You remember the instance in Mark 5 when the woman uh, with the issue of blood, she touches the hem of Jesus' garment and power flows out of her and she is healed immediately. And Jesus says, who touched me? Because he felt power flow out of him. So, you know, something about the dynamics of the anointing, how the anointing, the power of God uh, uh, actually worked in delivering people. So, uh, these things happen there. And you know, God is so gracious uh, that in an environment where, you know, I already told us they were familiar, black magic, witchcraft, sorcery, practices such as those, the power of God is demonstrated in a greater measure. We also notice here that people observed how Paul actually exercised or how he cast out demons. So he cast out demons with the authority in the name of Jesus. Now, here's another lesson for us. In verse 13, there are uh, uh, the, the, the people of Ephesus who just use the principle. So they have no relationship with Jesus. Uh, in other words, they are not born again. They're just using the principle, which is the name of Jesus, the authority of the name of Jesus. They use that to cast out demons. Uh, so they say something like, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. So the relationship that, uh, uh, you know, Paul had with Jesus is that of, you know, uh, Paul being born again. But obviously, they didn't have a relationship with Jesus, which is why they didn't preach about the Lord Jesus. Uh, and it never worked. They just use the principle. Principle without the relationship uh, would not release the authority which we have in the name of Jesus. So, very 
uh, sort of very different what what we see here uh, in in this particular incident that the authority of the name of jesus was not functional for those who were not born again so again you know it just helps us realize uh, because of our relationship with the lord jesus what a privilege we can use the authority that god has given us in his name so obviously what happened they used the principle it never worked uh, and the evil spirit answered and said to them uh, jesus i know and paul i know but who are you so uh, we realize that the demonic world recognizes those who are uh, in christ okay those who are in christ now there are some people who interpret this as those who are walking in authority in christ so you know people like paul uh, and jesus so obviously we know that the demonic powers uh, know everyone who is part of the uh, kingdom of light uh, but for whatever reason in this uh, particular passage there is a mention of jesus and paul so yeah maybe uh, uh, they just brought out the names of uh, uh, the people involved you know in this particular uh, incident because they said we exercise you in the name of jesus whom paul preaches so i don't know how far we can say that uh, you know the power of god is only functional or or the kingdom of darkness recognizes only those who uh, carry you know great anointings uh, in the in the body of christ okay so uh, that's something for us to recognize here uh, say you have something to say i can see your hand raised yes pastor thank yes, you so much go ahead. I, yeah, think, no I just have a question yeah uh, for a long time actually the sons of skeva has been a um classic topic of discussion uh -huh. when it comes to casting out demons and our relationship with Jesus Christ. But if I may ask, um, I would just like to know, do you know the historical background to this set of people? It seems like there were people who were into exorcism um, outside of the name of Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, by what means were they doing this? You know, um, because it seems like they might have been seeing results in Paul and they were like, oh, okay, hmm. he's using the name of Jesus to cast out demons. You know, let's try this out. So what were they doing before that time? Or am I going too far thinking too much about, <laughs> about what they were doing before? I, I, I just thought maybe you might have an answer to that. Um, okay, thank you, Say Thank you for that. Um, see, we know that this particular place of Ephesus uh, was involved in the worship of goddess Diana. So unlike a place like Corinth, which was a sin city and, you know, um, some of the practices that they were involved in was prostitution. Paul really had to address that when he wrote to the uh, Corinthians. But when you read about the city of Ephesus, you know, it's a spiritual city in the sense that they were, as I mentioned, dabbling with the occult. So when you read the book of Ephesians, you know, towards the end of that book, um, you would find that Paul talks about spiritual warfare. Okay, he talks about the the weapons uh, or, or the armor that a believer needs to put on. So it just goes to say that these people, the people of Ephesus, uh, were, were quite deep in black magic and witchcraft. Okay, now how did they get into it? I'm not too sure. See, every, every deity uh, comes with you know, their own set of requirements. So maybe uh, one of the requirements of worship for the goddess Dina was witchcraft. So that could have been one of the reasons. Uh, and uh, the seven sons of Skiva, 
I don't know too much about you know their historical background, but suffice to say that they were like my assumption. They were like Simon the Sorcerer of Samaria, uh, who were quite famous. So uh, we we'll see that you know after these people are not able to cast out demons and they get beaten up, uh, that actually results in a, a positive response in the city right so people uh, are able to understand that there is a power which is greater than the demonic powers which they had experienced so far and uh, you know the word of god grew mightily is what we read so they are probably a set of popular uh, exorcists or you know a set of popular black magicians Th that's all i know say but uh, you know if you want to research more you can always uh you know research it further so does that help it does help thank you pastor thank you oh, okay all right yep thank you so uh, uh coming back to what we just read here we saw that when somebody used only the principle and they did not have a relationship with jesus they are not part of the kingdom of light so the response of the kingdom of darkness is so different they actually these seven sons of skiva verse 16 uh, uh, that the man in whom the evil spirit were, was leaped on them overpowered them and prevailed against uh, prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded now what happens after that an incident like this where god's power is seen you know in a uh, uh, in a very unusual way what what is the outcome verse 17 this became known both to all jews and greeks dwelling in ephesus and fear fell on them all and the name of the lord jesus was magnified so even an incident like this reveals to the people that hey so far the power which we used to know is not the greatest power there is a higher authority you know as uh, opposed to what we were we were working with and so it results in the name of the lord jesus being magnified okay, so they would have used all other names who knows they might have even used the name of diana but now they recognize there's a greater name, the Lord Jesus, and not just the name, but his people. Something special about these people and the authority that they carry. And verse 18, look at this. This is, this is the, uh, a, a very important part that we study uh, about Ephesus. Verse 18, and many who had practiced magic brought their books together and okay I, I skipped that verse verse 18 and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds okay verse 19 also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all and they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So the impact on that city was people brought their uh, uh, things of magic, okay, whatever they use for magic, and they actually burnt it up. And uh, there is a, uh, you know, like a estimation done of what 50,000 pieces of silver might uh, uh, be worth today and it is estimated at anywhere between one and five million dollars so you know we can imagine that uh, so many people brought their things worth so much and they burnt it because they realized what they were doing was not uh, you know of the kingdom of light and uh, paul's ministry had an incredible effect on the city of Ephesus. So think about this. A man goes to a city which is steeped in witchcraft. He preaches Christ. God's power is seen through his life. 
what is the outcome the people of the city you know bring tons of their uh, uh, material which has to do with witchcraft and they burn it worth 1 to 5 million dollars so uh, incredible success isn't it incredible success that he had uh, in the city of ephesus now not only that we've also seen how you know he was teaching in the school of tyrannus uh, and uh, he again taught for about 2 years in that in that uh, school of tyrannus so he had the opportunity to equip lots of people not just in the city but you know across the region and also uh, we we read that there were people from asia whom he can he could actually equip in that place so a uh, very good ministry took place in the city of ephesus but as satan would you know uh, try to hinder them in each city he began uh, doing his works against paul even in the city of ephesus so from verse 21 we read about riots that actually broke out so uh, could somebody please read from verse 21 okay let's see yes uh, christopher uh, you have something to say uh, yes pastor i just want yeah. to share You know, yeah, right. sure. Let's focus on this uh, word, uh, uh, exorcism. Um, is this something that um, you know we would, uh, as as uh, believers, would we use that word, uh, or is more like healing of you know of uh, uh, healing of evil spirits? Because as I understand, um, there is, you know, exorcism is is practiced by um, multiple re- religions, and. Uh, I mean, I think it's also there in you know in Hinduism, it's in Islam, and a uh, number of other religions also. And they use the word exorcism, or they use the you know the local term. Uh, that is one question. And the second question is, um, there are uh, you know pastors, um, believers. Uh, I think the one person who comes to mind is um, Pastor um, Derek Prince, who kind of focused on this particular idea. And um, Uh, healed a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, of their uh, evil spirits. So, um, uh, I guess the question is, um, um, that is something that is is I know I I mean is practiced and uh, um, and I think in, a, in an earlier chapter you had also mentioned about uh, you know some of the experiences you had you know seeing this happen, uh, particularly in the in some of the rural areas. So. Um, the question is uh, is there something that you know is, is is needs to be followed and you know is there a need to kind of focus in that particular area yes uh, thank you christopher thank you for that uh, question the term exorcist exorcism so i was just looking it up actually um in the greek Okay. All right. Well, uh, yeah, not sure. Okay, it doesn't uh, really give me too much here as I look up the word um, exorcists. One that binds by an oath. But one that binds by an oath. is uh, what it says so yeah uh, does seem to give me too much about the historical background but you know we could uh, study about it uh, but from what i know uh, christopher uh, the word describes the act of casting out a demon so there's nothing wrong like if we use the term uh, exorcism for casting out of demons uh, but in the christian world i don't hear that word at all my assumption my assumption is that uh, maybe this word exorcism uh, is you know it it uh, depicts depicts the attempt to cast out demons in many cultures uh, 
and not necessarily you know as as a born again believer and with the authority uh, in Christ Jesus for example even here in in the city of Ephesus exorcists so you know it's a profession uh, uh or a practice which was so common and they did not even know that you know there is something like a relationship with god required for them to be able to be successful in casting out the demon so maybe the christian world did not adopt this word because of uh, you know all, all this uh, wrong kind of understanding which was associated with it okay that's my assumption because after the lord jesus uh, you know began doing his ministry and then you had the acts uh, of the apostles and later people who believed in jesus they somewhere stayed away from this word because it meant all the practices that people followed uh, in trying to cast out demons okay so christopher does it make sense this this is my assumption from what i know right thank you yeah so we we don't really see that word we simply say cast out demons and derek prince so your question about derek prince uh, christopher Um, actually, it, it was more, more of a kind of a comment about you yeah. know the focus that is there on uh, you know this particular area, yeah. and um, I know that you know there are other denominational churches that have have uh, you know priests who you know focus in that particular area, and uh, you know they just sort of um, do yes. this as you know as as the main sort of uh, area of uh, specialty. Yes. Yeah. Sure. So uh, we we might see that you know some people are we use the term uh, they carry the anointing for deliverance. Uh, so we might see more of deliverance as part of their ministry compared to others. So it's it's because of the kind of grace and anointing that uh, people carry. But obviously we know that every believer can uh, walk. With the power of God to bring deliverance, and you're right. Uh, when we read about ministers like Derek Prince, uh, they have uh, incredible experience in uh, deliverance. Uh, and uh, remember, we also studied about the Pablo Botari model, right? Uh, one of the South American ministers. Now, when there's a lot of experience, one is also able to learn of some commonalities in the deliverances that they uh, uh, see happen so they get that learning and they share it so the same way you have the pablo botari model that we discuss about and derek prince in his uh, books you know uh, i think it says what you shall cast out demons uh, he also shares many of his learnings about how demons behave how you can approach and also it's very helpful for believers when they engage in deliverance so yeah thank you for uh, 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 bringing up this subject uh, so yeah now we have understood you know, what exactly happened there was a great impact uh, upon the city of ephesus and a riot broke out so let's read from verse 21 of acts 19 uh, we could go till verse 34 Okay, a very long uh, section there, verse 21 to verse 34. So who is up to reading this long passage? Asha. Yeah, yes, Asha, please read. After Paul felt compelled by the Spirit to go over to Macedonia and Achaia before going to Jerusalem, and after that he said, I must go on to Rome, he sent his two assistants, Timothy and Aristus, ahead to Macedonia while he stayed a, a while longer in the province of Asia. About that time, serious trouble developed in Ephesus. Concerning the way, it began with Demetrius, a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddesses, Artemis. He kept many craftsmen busy. He called them together, all along with others employed in similar trades, and addressed them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business, but as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded 
Many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And he's done that and he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddesses, Artemis, will lose its influence and that Artemis, these magnificent goddesses worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. And there, at this, their anger boiled and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was filled with confusion. Everyone rushed to the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Paul wanted to go in too, but the builders would not, wouldn't let him. Some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, also sent a message to him, begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. Inside the people were all shouting, some one, some one thing and some another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander forward and told him to explain the, situa explain the situation. He motioned for silence and tried to speak. But when the crowd realized that he was a Jew, they started shouting again and kept it up for about two hours. Great is our Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Yes. Uh, thank you, Asha. So as uh, we can quite clearly see, the impact on the city, um, uh, you know, is is uh, manifold. So we have seen already how the people who are practicing uh, black magic, they brought their things and they burnt it. Now, what was also happening is that the business was affected. OK, uh, and uh, we have seen that this was a very famous place Ephesus and it was known for uh, the goddess and people also say that uh, during the times you know when when the city of Ephesus existed uh, it was one of the seven wonders or something like that the temple of the goddess uh, Dinah was one of the seven wonders so people had taken incredible effort to uh, yeah, to sculpt out the temple and uh, establish the pillars of the temple and people would come from all over the place it was, the city was known for the goddess the city was known for the temple now when people started believing in jesus christ what happened uh, many of them would have left the trade of making this goddess in okay, the idols so that is where demetrius one of the businessmen who had employed people to make the idols of this goddess dina he got very upset because uh, if there are no workers and if the idols are not produced uh, or you know whatever souvenirs are not produced then how is he going to make money? So it affected the business. Okay, do you remember another place where uh, 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 a business of a community was affected? And instead of applauding and commending the power of God, you know, people in their small thinking are worried about their business in the natural, uh, in the natural realm so you know jesus uh, if you recall he cast out demons uh out, out of a man and then they begged to go into pigs once they went into the pigs the pigs went and they uh died right in, in the water and what the people say they said hey jesus can you please leave our uh, place because you're affecting um our business and money is more important for us so something very similar uh, is seen here in ephesus and people's business especially this man demetrius it is uh, affected and so he brings this up as an issue and uh, you know he uh, he wants a response right so there's a, literally a riot and uh, we know that people gathered as a mob and they began to shout and uh, they began to glorify their own goddess hoping that all this noise will cause the person in charge right of the city to take action but at the same time you know, we uh, recognize here that um, this all happened in a theater 
uh, and they also laid hands on some of the co-workers of Paul. So you have names like Gaius and Aristarchus. These are Macedonians. So you see, as we go forward, the team which Paul had is becoming larger and larger. Okay, so he was never really alone in any given place. So he has team members here, Paul's travel companions. Now, Paul also wanted to go to the theater, but the disciples will not allow him because it was very dangerous. You know, he might have uh, been uh, beaten up or, uh, you know, he, he would have uh, been treated very badly. So which is why the disciples protected him. So all this was going on and uh, they expected a person, Alexander, <coughs> Uh, uh, who again would have been an authority, some sort of an authority or influential figure in the city of Ephesus to uh, do something. So he uh, motions his hand and wants to make a defense to the people. Okay? But people's uh, attitude is one of fury. They're angry with uh, Paul. They're angry with his team. And you know they want nothing to do with Paul and the city. So from verse 35 to verse 41, uh, can uh, another person please read 35 to 41? Okay, any volunteers? Yes, yes, brother, please go ahead. Shikumar, uh, you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And when the town clerk had appeared, the people, he said, You men of Ephesus, what man, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana and the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then, seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against you out to be quite and to do nothing rashly for you have brought hither these men which are neither robbers of the churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess wherefore wherefore if the Dem demetrius and the craftsman which are with him have a matter against against any man the law is open and uh, there are there are there are disputes that implead one another. Till 40, we have to read. 41. No? But if yes. you if if if, uh, if you if you inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby. We may we may give an account of this on course, and and he had, and when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, thank you, Shri Kumar. So, uh, uh, what we see is uh, there is an attempt. Okay, so this person Alexander, he motions with his hand, he tries to quieten things down, uh, uh, but I I don't think you know they they were ready to listen. So the city clerk. Like you know, he uh, emerges and he uh, puts this across and says, the issue is of Demetrius. You know that his business is being affected. So there is a proper way. There is a legal way of dealing with uh, this particular issue. If he has a problem with Paul, let him go. Basically, what he's saying is, let him approach the courts, uh, let him uh, let him fight the the case, let him make the allegation, and let it be taken in an orderly manner. Uh, and uh, let us not have this sort of a uh, mob reaction. Now, one of the reasons why uh, it was very important to uh, uh, quieten any mob and bring order uh, in the region or in the cities is because the Roman Empire was strict, strictly against cities where there would be an uproar. You know, it, there'll be something like uh, we say here in India, precedence rule, like the, the, uh, the central government will take over, okay? And uh, uh, all, the, all the laws will be suspended. And, and 
people will not have the freedom which which they were practicing so something there was a risk of something like that happening and which is why uh, any kind of an uproar in a city was not liked by the authorities they were scared of the roman authorities coming and taking over so uh, the clerk made his effort to quieten down the people and thank god you know in every city god has his way even through the authorities of the city to protect his people so again you know paul has an escape here because uh, uh, the authorities uh, just instruct uh, demetrius and say hey do this in the proper way and stop making all this noise and creating commotion uh, in the city so don't do this with a disorderly gathering and thank god and when he had said these things he dismissed the assembly so he dismissed this crowd you know, which had gathered and one uh, interesting uh, thought there is that word assembly there is ecclesia okay it's the word that we usually use for the church so assembly is also uh, the church is a people who are called out but uh, the church can also be understood as a understood as a gathering of god's people so that's about what happened in the city of ephesus uh, so after this we we will uh, go through acts chapter 20 we'll start from verse 1 so we have only 2 minutes but i'm sure we can cover this so acts chapter 20 if someone can read from verse 1 to verse 6 that will be helpful Uh, yes, Sasha. Please go ahead. When the uproar was over, Paul sent for the believers and encouraged them. Then he said goodbye and left for Macedonia. While there, he encouraged the believers in all the towns he passed through. Then he traveled down to Greece, where he stayed for three months. He was preparing to sail back to Syria when he discovered a plot by some Jews against his life. So he decided to return through Macedonia. Several men were traveling with him. They were Sopater, son of Phyrus from Berea, Aristarchus, and Sicandros from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy and Tychus, and Trophimus from the province of Asia. They went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. After the Passover ended, we boarded a ship at Philippi in Macedonia, and five days later joined them in Troas, where we stayed a week. Yes, thank you, Asha. So as you can see there, uh, Paul, you know, he goes through other regions, and the beautiful thing about the passage that we just read is he has people in many different places who are now his co-workers. So there is an entire list, you know, Sopater of uh, Beria, Aristarchus, and Secundus of the Thessalonians. So apparently, Aristarchus is a name which is given to. Uh, Uh, a, a very rich family so their heritage is that they are from a uh, high class in society and secundus is a name that uh, was given to a class of slaves okay slaves so notice how god has touched every section of the society you have the fellowship of somebody who is from an aristo democratic family and somebody from a slave family but the the beauty is they are all part of the kingdom of god they are now all co-workers in the kingdom of god they are part of the team of uh, uh, paul so so many names kes of derby uh, timothy timothy obviously is from lystra you also have people from asia tychicus trophimus so uh, it's beautiful to read that now there are so many people who are uh, with Uh, Paul, they are traveling with Paul, and uh, he has this huge team. And uh, how wonderful that he's not alone, and he has been careful to establish, you know, a second line of leadership uh, that will take charge of the many churches. Maybe uh, uh, Paul by himself or through his influence planted about twenty churches, but. it was not just paul anymore you have so many uh, men and women of god leaders 
know, in their own right, who were taking charge and who were leading these church plants that Paul had initiated. Okay, so and the travel continues. So what we'll do is we'll come back in the next uh, session. We will look at the map of Paul's third missionary journey to gain uh, some more uh, understanding, and then we will continue on from there. So uh, it's uh, nine fifty one now. Let's go for a break. We'll come back at ten o one and uh, pick up from where we stopped. Thank you, everyone. See you soon.